Well, good morning again, Suburban. We have this further opportunity to speak with Gary and Faith McKay, who for many years have been a missionary family that we've been supporting through Suburban. And Gary and Faith have been serving with New Tribes Missions in Papua New Guinea for a long time. But they've been home also for longer than they expected. And we have an opportunity right now to hear a little bit more from Gary and Faith about what they've been doing what they, and what they would hope to be doing. You may have seen our brief interview, which we showed on Sunday morning, but here's an opportunity to hear a little bit more of life in the McKay family. So good morning again, Gary and Faith. Lovely to see you. Um, it's really good for us to be able to have a chat because we, we know all about you, but we just haven't having a chance to, to have you at church this year. Sadly, there are many of us who know you well, but some who don't know you. So we're looking forward just to hearing a little bit more about, about you this morning and your family and, and your ministry. So why don't you start off by telling us a little bit about, a little bit more perhaps about your family and, and, and who you are. Well, Gary, Gary was born in Gippsland and grew up in that area. And I was born in the Mallee and grew up around there and in Ichuka in, in my teenage years. And we both went to Melbourne to study teaching and that's where we met in independent Baptist church circles around there. And um, yeah, that's where we got married and we went to missionary training in 93, uh, so 95. <laughs> 95, we spent a couple of years there in missionary training. And then after we finished training, we decided because we didn't have any children, it was a bit easier for us. We went up to Papua New Guinea for three and a half months. And we spent two and a half months, I think, in a tribal situation. And that was my first experience in a tribal situation. And it was mind blowing. Mm, okay. and very, very um, grow, growing time. So that was before we did our first deputation. Then we came back home, did our deputation around Victoria mainly and some churches in Sydney. And then we went back in 99 after Claire was born. So we have two children. Claire's just finishing teaching training this year. She's very excited, but she's very busy at the moment trying to finish off her last few assignments. She's got three and a half weeks left and she would love to um, be a missionary herself, whether she is a missionary teacher or whether she ends up in a tribal situation, she's not sure. Mm. Cade is still working on schooling and um, would love to come back to Papua New Guinea with us. So we're hoping that will happen too. Mm. Excellent. Thanks so much, Faith. Um, you touched on where you met and your initial um, introduction to, to, to tribal life in PNG. Tell us a bit further about uh, how it was you actually moved to where you have spent the last 20 years or so. How did that come about? Okay. Um, well, we're on the island of New Britain. It's like a, a banana, a long banana shaped island. And um, West New Britain, uh, Quite a few missionaries had been in the tribes, or a lot of the tribes in Western Britain had been covered. Not all of them, but most of them. And the mission was moving up the island toward Rabaul. Um, there is a big map in the common room at Hoskins Mission Base, and it's got a, a, it's a map of Papua New Guinea, and it's got the different um, tribal groups where they're located, and contours and so forth. And so the time we were looking to uh, locate somewhere, I looked on the map, Coal was the, the next logical um, uh, place to, to look at. And then, so I looked at where, where the coal were um, located, what, what territory they're located in, and contours and so forth. And I saw that there was um, a whole lot of rings, really tight rings to the northern end of, of coal territory. And there were a couple of blocks indicating villages inside those rings. And I knew that there was a Catholic mission um, well to the south, and um, sometimes uh, there are difficulties when, when you're working around um, Catholic missions like that. I thought, well, that looks pretty isolated. How about the, uh, we tell the helicopter pilot to fly us there? So he did. He said, okay. 
We got on, it's about an hour's flight from Hoskins and he landed right in the middle of those rings and it happened to be a deep canyon. Wow. Uh, with uh, two rivers flowing through it, really deep. And uh, there were about 100 people in there at that time. Uh, yeah, really, really isolated and uh, uh, very undeveloped. Um, just subsistence farmers, um, animistic, um, very fearful of spirits and so forth. But anyway, we landed there and they said straight away, we would like you to come. Wow. Um, they needed permission from a, a chief that wasn't there. So we went back two, two weeks later and we got permission from him and, and things moved on pretty quickly from there. We, um, yeah. uh, about two months after that, uh, another missionary and myself went back there um, with two chainsaws and slabbed a whole lot of timber uh, for a house. And, uh, and then another two months after that, um, two of my brother-in-laws from here in Bendigo flew up there with two other missionaries up there and um, built a house in about three weeks or so, um, wow. down to a language study pretty quickly. So it all happened um, within about nine months, we were set up and in, in into language study. Now, I've forgotten the year, Gary. Is it around, around 2000 or where are we? 1999. 1999. Yeah. Now, you told us a little bit about the people. What, how would you describe the, the cold people and, and, and how did they, they, they received you well? Um, that must have been quite a transition for them and for you. So when we first went there, like they were very happy to have us there, but um, there's a big thing in the area with cargo, like the white people or somebody's going to come and provide all this cargo and things. So we, we're sure there was a lot of that and misconceptions about exactly who mm. we were and what we wanted to do. I can just cut in there. Um, we learned later that um, some of the people thought that we were dead ancestors who had come back in order mm. to um, help this cargo to arrive uh, you know, in the community there um, mysteriously or supernaturally. Um, wow. So cargo is basically goods. Axes, yeah. rice, uh, chainsaws, right. uh, cars, whatever. Yeah. It's, it's a, uh, cargoism is right across Papua New Guinea, yes. uh, but there are particularly particular areas where it's, it's very strong and uh, uh, even breaks out into political movements. Um, anyway, uh, yeah, Eastern Britain is a very strong cargo cult area. And yeah, we were thought as being a fulfillment of, mm. uh, of predictions of, of people who were coming to bring the cargo in. But back to you, Faith. Yeah, so they were very happy. They're very, they're very friendly people and they were happy for us to come there. But even though Gary and the guys that went in tried to explain, okay, we're there to tell them God's talk, we're not, we think, yeah, a lot of it was because they wanted sort of thing. Mm. That they've had government sort of promised them things over the years, but nothing really happened as far as schooling and med medical clinic. And so, yeah, they're, they're sort of like a, were like a forgotten people in some ways. Yeah. There wasn't any government aid or help in there. And mm. yeah, they were keen to have someone who could help them. They knew very little too. Like um, I remember uh, one morning uh, we were in the, the men's hut and someone said, Port Moresby. Have you heard of Port Moresby? Uh, what country is Port Moresby in? Because they heard of it, but they didn't realise it was their capital city. Mm, wow. <laughs> That's remarkable, isn't it? It's really not that long ago um, for us here in, you know, comfortable Western Werribee. So, yeah. wow. So tell us, Gary, you, you, I think you mentioned there that you started language studies almost straight away. Tell us, what were you doing in those early years? To learn the language. Well, the language and, and what was life like for you and your family in those, and, and, and perhaps uh, expanding on what your, your ministry really looked like. Okay. Um, we're encouraged um, not to try to evangelise the people mm. until, until we get to a, a certain proficiency yes. or understanding of the culture and of the language. Yes. Um, that's so things are not miscommunicated. Um, anyway, uh, so for the first, uh, our first term went for four years, and that was uh, language study, so minimum of eight hours a day, and there are different aspects that you cover uh, with that. But we also started a medical clinic in those uh, mm. pr pretty quickly. So a typical day for me was I get up very early in the morning before dawn 
and do a couple of hours of language study, listening to the tapes and so forth that I've made, practicing. Um, medical clinic was something like eight o'clock and sometimes that would go for an hour or so, uh, sometimes just a few minutes, but sometimes an hour. Um, and then breakfast and then uh, language through the day. Um, Faith would be uh, homeschooling or um, looking after Claire when, when she's little. Um, and so basically, yeah, just uh, needed two hours of exposure, which means you go out with the people, went to the gardens, uh, sit in the houseboy, talk to the fellows, those sorts of things. Um, and that would take us through to about, yeah, late afternoon and then um, make a fire for hot water. Um, yeah, we, we just do a campfire outside, put pots on, the people can see that, you know, we, we live like them in some ways. Mm. Uh, and do the same thing next day. So um, wow. basically just over and over and over for, yeah, for four years. Wow. And, and how did that develop? As Because we're looking at, you've been there 20 odd years. Um, so if we went back just before you, you came home there a few months ago, were you still boiling the water outside? Were you still in the gardens? What, what did life look like for the Mackay family? before you came home just in these last last few months? Yeah, oh, very different, uh, yeah. very, very different. Um, uh, yeah, it's Cade or, yeah, someone do a fire, often would be Cade doing a fire, but no, um, now, um, let's see, a typical day would be, let's say a Tuesday would be um, up and then we have a um, translation committee meeting I have um, about six young fellas, and it doubles up as a discipleship lesson too, actually, but uh, we meet together. Uh, faith comes as well. Um, and uh, I have a, a section, say, uh, 12 verses, um, say, in Ephesians or something we might be working on. Uh, faith reads it through in Pigeon, uh, just for those that have any understanding of Pigeon. Uh, and then... Uh, I might read it through in Cole, and then we take verse by verse, and I read a verse, okay, is that communicating? Uh, what do you think? And uh, they're not forward. If there's, if there's a mistake or something that doesn't communicate well, I'll often sit there and look around, you know, who's going who's gonna to tell him <laughs> that wasn't right? So I think they're, they're not really aggressive and super forward. So it takes a while, but they'll come out with eventually and they'll suggest something. And so we fix it up, we try again, next verse and so forth. We work through that. And then that often takes about an hour and a half, maybe sometimes two hours. And then at the end of that, Faith goes, types up our new draft, uh, prints it out, we hand it out to them. And then I'll see them again uh, about four or five days later. They'll memorize a section of it and give it, just give it back from memory. And mm. as they do that, they don't realise it, but they often correct things unwittingly, and I can get that as well. So that's that's the, the translation committee. Uh, after that, I'll often have a, so on a Tuesday, I'll have a, a translation helper that will be in my office, and we'll be working on a, a new section. Um, uh, okay, I, I've done a translation draft, and I'll be going over that draft with him, and I'll read it to him. He'll be making um, suggestions and so forth that is the draft that I'll take to the committee at a later date. Okay, so I'll work with him. That might go for about two hours. Uh, be lunch. And then in the afternoon, I'll be working by myself in the office, um, uh, maybe writing a lesson uh, for church or, uh, or, or a new draft of, of something in the New Testament, another book that we're working on, which is ahead of my translation helper. Uh, so I'll be working basically by myself um, in the office for the afternoon, uh, in the evening, yeah, maybe you know, talk to some people under the house or whatever. Um, might go over and check to someone in the village. Uh, might be medical issues. Um, we don't have to do medical clinic now. Medical clinic was a very heavy burden when we we're doing language study. It was mm. very stressful. Uh, that's in the hands of the people. Uh, they come to us if there's something that they don't understand or if there's a bad gash or um, something that they want me to check out. Uh, otherwise, the normal run of the day things they handle themselves. So that's a Tuesday. A Friday looks like that as well. Um, uh, Thursday mornings and Sunday mornings, we've got church. 
Um, sometimes I'll do the preaching. Uh, often it'll be the guys, and we're listening to how he goes, making... Um, mm. we've, we've got his draft in front of us and we're listening to changes he makes unwittingly and recording those. Um, that's a Thursday and a Sunday. Um, and yeah. So the people are running the literacy program. So yeah. we may go down maybe once a week or something just to see how it's going. We provide all the materials still. They're, uh, I'm pretty sure they will not be running anything while we're away because mm. we didn't know we were going to be away. So we didn't mm. give enough materials for them to keep going with it. So that's unfortunate. But um, up until we left, they, yeah, they were running running the literacy now, I think I, I, I might have caused you to jump ahead there a little bit because um, I think we, w when you arrived, uh, there were no Christians there, were there? No. And now you, you're talking about us, they're preaching, they're, they're, they're helping with translation. We better go back a little bit. Can you remember, <laughs> can you remember um, maybe the, the, the first people who, who came to Christ and, and that, what that must have been like for you? Yeah, that was great. Uh, that was would have been 2005. Mm. Um, at the end of about four months of uh, of teaching, Mondays, Tuesdays, I think it was four days a week anyway, uh, we, we avoided Sundays because we didn't want to think that, you know, we were church. Yep. So it was just teaching. Uh, at the end of that, uh, the last session was, okay, there's the teaching, that's the gospel, what's your response, what do you think? And... I think that morning, about 12, 15 people gave public testimonies, the fact that wow. they were trusting in the deliverer who God sent mm. uh, as his way to make a, a way that we can be right before before God. Sapi was one of them. Um, I think m most of those professions were uh, legitimate and people born again. Some of them weren't. Yep. I think there are others that didn't speak up that might have been born again, but... but um, Anyway, we, we did the um, evangelism program again about two years later uh, and some more, but it's been done about four, mm -hmm. maybe five times in an aura, and each time there's a few more. Mm -hmm. um, they're not all Christian. Okay, there were about 100 people when we first moved to aura. There'd be about 200 now. Yeah. Uh, they're not all believers, uh, but a, there's a, a, a really good number of them are. And there's a bit of a continuum. You've got some that are uh, you know, coming along and so forth, but you've got others at the other end of the spectrum that are really gung-ho, really faithful, uh, really be behind the work, and um, you know, they're caught on. Mm, the, the mm. acts, you know, what's happening in Acts when Paul goes out and um, it goes out with Barnabas and Silas and so forth. Um, sometimes the men will go to other villages, uh, not with the teaching, but just to... To witness and let them know that you know uh, the teaching is there and they'll give the, the basics of it and you know if you guys want it we'll try and bring it to you one day and or come across and be involved in literacy and um yeah you can take the teaching back to your village which has happened and on yep we've no, got, uh, yeah yeah that, that's that's exciting you've you've seen the the birth of the faith and and you've seen it come to maturity in many of many of the coal people by the sound of it to the extent they're going into other villages now you've had to put a lot of your work on hold um what what do you hope you'll find and that you'll continue to do when you return to new britain okay there are four churches at the moment mm. the main one at aura a smaller one four hours south uh a middle-sized, well, quite a large one, uh, four hours southeast, and then another one uh, around about eleven hours to the east. Okay. Um, and Gary, when you say four hours, eleven hours, oh. that's that's <laughs> uh, not by um, yeah hiking. Hiking, oh, hiking. Not hiking by me, but hiking by the, by the local people. Yeah, the local fast. <laughs> wow. Okay. So what what we're hoping is that each of those four churches are still meeting they've still got materials and 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 they're still um teachers are ministering to the people so we're, we're, we're hoping that they're all still uh functioning like that mm. um uh they, they're all waiting for more material so yeah they're probably revising things that they've already heard at the moment um but uh we should be able to take that material in with us when we go um 
there's uh, the, the church 11 hours to the east. They're waiting to start literacy. There's also a, a, another group of people about an hour and a half further south from them again uh, who are waiting to do an evangelistic program. Mm. So we, we would like the guy, some of the guys at, um, at Aura to help with the literacy program at Gulubier, 11 hours to the east, and then a, um, someone to go and help two guys further on again to do an evangelistic program. Mm. Uh, and, and then um, hopefully, um, so we've got teachers in the four churches, and then we've got some um, young guys who are reading the Bible scripture portions to help the teachers. We're hoping that some of those young guys are coming on and will be able to become teachers themselves. We're hoping also that we haven't had some teachers disqualify themselves. Okay. Um, which is things that things do go on. Yep. Uh, yep. And if they do, the other teachers around around know to stand them out if that things mm. things happen. So yep. So we'll see. What what to what extent have you been able to communicate with with leaders and, and friends over the last 18 months? Has that been possible? Just twice. Yep. Uh, and that's uh, both times some guys have walked out from Aura all the way across to uh, the next tribe which is uh, probably a two and a half day hike to the east, uh, place, uh, tribe's called Mangan. And the missionary over there actually has um, a satellite dish and, uh, and phones and so forth. And so he was able to contact us uh, and I was able to see our guys on the phone. And, uh, so we, we talked uh, twice for about an hour both times about how things are going. That, that's basically it. Wow. Yeah. Well, I can tell that you are very keen to get back there. Um, uh, dare I say it, um, Gary and Faith, you are um, just ordinary Aussie people. Very much so. Uh, but doing, from our point of view, extraordinary work, uh, empowered by God alone. Is there anything else you'd like to share with us as we come sort of towards the close of our time? Things that, that would be good for us to hear at Suburban, uh, those who support you prayerfully and, and practically as you head off again. What else would you like us to hear? Well, we'd like to thank you guys for supporting us and praying for us. And yeah, that's a real a real encouragement to us just to know that, that you're doing that. It's been a long time now. <laughs> it's been yeah. a long time. Yeah. Uh, so thank you for that. Um, yeah, uh, just it really is exciting to see. Yeah, for the first few years when we're over there, uh, people were sitting, you know, at church just listening. You know, what's what's he presenting, or what are they presenting today? Oh, that's interesting, and yeah, that's good, and and so forth. But then when we got out of um, the evangelism program, and then we call a thing phase two, which is a, a review of that, and then we got into acts. When we got into acts things come to life and it's mm. exciting. Wow. And, um, yeah, so it's, it, yeah, we've, we've been privileged to do what we do because we've seen it sort of take off. Uh, they've been hard times as well, but they're really exciting times as well. So it's been, we would do it all again if we could. <laughs> um, and just just a pre-point, just for the next um, two weeks, we um, the mission has, has been able to give us an extension on the next helicopter flight. Uh, it's been postponed from the 18th to November 1. We really need to be able to make that, that uh, flight, that, mm. that date. Mm. And for, for that to happen, we need things to happen in, in Port Moresby, in an office somewhere, for someone to um, give us permission to enter the country. Um, normally, it takes between one and three weeks to do. We, we, we had delays about other things. They were sorted out. But we need this this documentation to come through. Um, and it needs to come through pretty quickly. Yes. Uh, you know, within the next week or so, so we can make plans and and then apply to the Australian government, which shouldn't take all that long. So just so people can be praying that um, we can we can have this um, authority to enter the country um, come through. Yeah, within the week. We also and need to have 
negative COVID tests before we leave. So, yeah. and yeah. there are cases we're hearing of more and more in Bendigo. So wow. we, yeah, so we're not sure how that's going to happen either. And also need things to fit into place so Kate can join you. Yes. But lots for us to be praying about. Well, Gary and Faith, thank you so much for sharing with us this morning. Um, we haven't been able to see you face to face at Suburban, but maybe next time uh, that you're home. Mm -hmm. And and I guess you're hoping it's not going to be in March when you have to, if, but you have to bring Kate home. Hopefully it's in, I don't know, would you look at three years or so, something like that? Who knows? Um, yeah, we'll, we'll see. If they give us a year, we'd be happy at that, but just whatever extension we can get, yep. if we can get one. All right. Well, God bless you. And uh, we look forward to seeing you in the near future. Yeah. Thank Thanks. you.